Section 1 of The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Michael Pluger, San Antonio, Texas. The Talking Handkerchief by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 1. The Talking Handkerchief. Whoever has lived any length of time in China, and given attention to the manners and customs of the pirates that infest the navigable waters along the coast, has a wholesome dread of falling into their hands. To be taken by Chinese pirates is nearly always equivalent to a death warrant, and not infrequently to death by torture. The Chinese freebooters hate the European as cordially as they are despised by him, and when he falls into their power they are not slow to make their feelings manifest. In the early part of the present century, there were more than five hundred piratical junks on the coast of Kuang Tung alone. Not only did they capture vessels on the water, but they extended their operations to the land and plundered towns and villages in great number. As long as the coolie trade flourished, the pirates were encouraged to continue their enterprises since they found a market at Macau for many of the prisoners taken in their excursions on shore or among the junks afloat. The suppression of the coolie traffic destroyed one of the sources of piratical revenue, and since the purchase or construction of steam gunboats by the Chinese government, the marauders are at a disadvantage owing to the ease with which they can be pursued and overtaken. But though greatly reduced in numbers, the piratical junks are yet sufficiently numerous to render the navigation of the bays and channels on the coast of Guangzhou and adjacent provinces far from safe. One of the tales that was told me in China I will here repeat. For convenience of narration I will give it in the first person singular, and singular enough it is to the American who has never seen Asia. Familiarity with the manners and customs of Chinese sailors during a residence of several years in the southern province had naturally made me reluctant to travel on native vessels, however peaceful might be the appearance of things in general. Judge, then, of my feelings when the chief of our house at Swato called me into the private office one afternoon and said he wished me to leave in an hour for Hong Kong. Certainly, I replied. I can be ready in half that time. But how am I to go? There is no steamer for a week at least. Quite right, he answered. I'm sorry there is none, as the business demands immediate attention. I wish there was a steamer to carry you down the coast, and the whole work could be finished in a day or two. After a slight pause, he added, I sent our comprador to find a junk and make arrangements for your passage. He came back a few minutes ago and said he had settled it with the Lodau, or captain, of a junk that was just getting up anchor for Hong Kong. It will take them an hour at least to hoist the anchor, and so you have that time to get on board with your servant and baggage. Then he gave me my instructions relative to the business I was to look after. As they have no bearing upon my adventures with the pirates, I shall not say what they were. It is about a hundred and fifty miles from Swato to Hong Kong, and as the northeast monsoon was blowing down the coast, it was then the middle of October, the junk could run steadily before the wind, and ought to make Hong Kong by the second morning after her departure. If all went well, she would be through the Lai Yi Moon Pass by daylight, and at anchor in the harbor an hour later. By nine o'clock I should be at breakfast with some old friends on Queen's Road, within stone's throw of the clock tower, and at ten o'clock would present myself at the office of Jardin, Matheson, and Company, for the transaction of the business which carried me away from Swato. I sent for John, my servant. John was not his Christian name. In fact, he was a heathen Chinese and there was nothing Christian about him in name or anything else. I always made it a rule to name my servant, John, without the least regard to the outlandish appellation he bore on entering my service. 
it saved an effort of the memory and efforts of that sort are worth something in china where you have half a world between you and your native land john i said my go hong kong side by tea meaning i'm going to hong kong immediately can do he responded my mickey allo palpa can do was the general reply meaning yes or all right and the rest of the answer was to the effect that he would attend to the preparations for departure it seemed that he had already been informed of the attended journey by the comprador and had my baggage almost ready when i summoned him your chinese or japanese servant is one of the most systematic beings in the world when you have once shown him what you wish to carry on a journey he never forgets and on the next occasion he will put up precisely the same articles unless you instruct him to the contrary he carries his system to absurdity sometimes and consequently must be watched if you make a trip of a couple of days this week and tell him what you want he will put everything in place according to instructions next week you may be starting for london or new york and when you inform him of your intention he will provide exactly the same things that he did for the absence of forty-eight hours to him london in ningpo new york in fu chow are ali semi and the only thought in his mind is that you are going on a journey and one is proper supply of under and outer clothing for the daily adornment of your person a sampan or native roadboat carried us to the junk which was slowly dropping down with the tide and getting her mat sails into position for catching the wind she forged through the water like a chip in a basin of molasses and her bluff bows were in marked contrast to the sharp prow of an american tea ship that was moored in the harbor and busily occupied with the reception of a cargo destined for consumption on the tables of yankee land we came up to the junk directly under her bows and i thought her great staring eye winked at me as though it knew i was a stranger to be taken in as the lodau saw us coming he ordered a ladder thrown over the side and we scrambled on board my baggage which included two boxes of silver i was to deliver in hong kong was passed up from the sampan and carefully watched by john till it was safe in the roomy cabin reserved for me at the stern of the junk comprador had accompanied us and as soon as i was safe on board he cast off the line that held the sampan to the side of the junk and with the wave of his hand in the direction of hong kong ejaculated good wind good water the pidgin english equivalent of bon voyage or good luck to you i said the captain ordered a ladder thrown to me a politeness that was hardly necessary as the sides of the junk amidships were only a few feet above the water and there were several ropes trailing over the side in the confusion consequent upon departure from port as soon as i reached the deck i looked around to see if there were any more captains than the one i have mentioned i found that the junk had two other commanders or at all events two men whose rights were nearly equal to those of the lowdown it happened in this way a chinese ship is divided into compartments and it seems that the plan of building ships in the manner greatly vaunted by modern navigators was invented in china centuries ago marco polo describes the compartment ships of the inhabitants of cathay as he found them about a d twelve fifty but it was not until nearly the middle of the present century that the idea was adopted by european shipwrights the compartments in a chinese junk when she is on a peaceful voyage are let out to individuals in the same way that rooms on a passenger ship are reserved to those who have hired them but there is this difference in the condition of things that while the passenger on the european steamship has nothing to do with the management of the craft the merchant who has hired a compartment on a chinese junk has a voice in her navigation the junk on which i had embarked was built in six compartments two of these had been let out to one man and two to another while the remainder were full of emptiness as a hibernian might say 
consequence was that there were two taipan or bosses in addition to the loda or regular captain and my servant soon found out that the taipans and loda were old acquaintances and friends and there was a strong suspicion that the taipans were part owners but they seemed to leave the management of the craft to the loda as they stood idly about and made no interference with his orders the open harbor of swateau favored our departure and in less than two hours after leaving our anchorage we were feeling the influence of the monsoon though it was a good deal broken by the islands of namoa and tung yung our course was for breaker point a notable headland on this part of the coast and known to the chinese as tong lei turning this headland in safety we should have nearly a straight road to hong kong as the general trend of the coast is to the southwest and almost in the track of the monsoon which blows down the coast from september till march even a chinese junk may do some very fair sailing with the monsoon at her heels at least fair for a junk when all the reefs were shaken out of our sails we dashed gallantly along at nearly five miles an hour left to myself and my cigar i took stock of things around me and tried to be comfortable john was a good cook as well as boy of all work and i knew he would attend to my dinner without special instructions the deck was covered with bales of merchandise boxes tubs and other odds and ends there were rollers or windlasses for hoisting purposes and there were coils and heaps of ropes that appeared in the most inextricable confusion the junk carried four brass guns resembling the sort we call carronades more than anything else their carriages were hewn from single blocks of wood and mounted on clumsy trucks and so many things were piled about the guns that their use in an emergency would be impossible but as soon as we were fairly out of the harbor and their services were not needed for manipulating the sails the men were set to work at cleaning up the rubbish and bringing order out of the confusion the boxes and their kindred soon disappeared into the holds the ropes were coiled away and the rubbish around the guns was removed custom is the same in many things the world over and as i looked at the process of cleaning up on board this chinese junk i was forcibly reminded of similar performances on ships in european or american waters the people of the junk attended to their own affairs and i looked after mine john held conference with the marine cook and in due time the result of their joint labors appeared in my room at the stern for the emergencies of sudden journeys we always kept the box filled with canned meats and vegetables a plum pudding or two various spices peppers sauces and a service of tableware another case contained wines and stronger beverages and if the journey was at all likely to be prolonged and provisions scarce the boxes were doubled or multiplied the provision and wine chest had not been forgotten with the boiled rice supplied by the junk's cook added to the contents of a tin can of american origin i had a capital curry of chicken which made the basis of my dinner blessings on the inventor of canned provisions they have softened the asperity of travel in outlandish countries more than any of you stay-at-homers can imagine dinner was served in my cabin a room about ten feet square directly under the position occupied by the man who steered the junk it was entered by a door from the deck and at the rear there was a good-sized window which looked upon the water the window was unusually wide for china but destitute of glass its place being supplied by a roll of matting and with an outside protection of lattice blinds the door was of solid plank at least two inches thick and hung upon wooden hinges it could be fastened by bolts also of wood and altogether my lodging place was by no means uncomfortable my baggage was piled close to the door and filled the space on each side of it and after dinner i ordered john to sling my hammock by the window so that i could enjoy my cigar in the breeze that was blowing the junk along to her destination it was rather cool for comfort 
but my overcoat and blanket soon made everything all right, and I had nothing to complain of. Until we rounded Breaker Point, I had a view of the receding coast. But as soon as we turned the headland, there was only the sea within the range of my vision. There were a few junction sites, one of them sailing in our direction. A foreign bark showing no flag so that I could only conjecture her nationality, was beating northward, evidently bound for Amoy. I watched her for some time, indulging in the fantasies of the far-off land whence she came, and recalling the days of my youth and early manhood. By and by night came upon us, and after a second cigar and a cup of tea, I told John to close the window and get my bed ready. I slept fairly well through the night in spite of the occasional rattling of the rigging and its attachments, the noise of the steersman over my head, and the creaking of the great rudder as it swung on its ponderous bearings. My bed was made on a canton chair, a sort of sofa or lounge of rattan, much affected by the foreigner in Cathay. John saw me safely in bed, and was about to hunt a sleeping place elsewhere, when it occurred to me that I might want him during the night, and I wouldn't know where to find him. So I told him to spread his mat and quilt on the floor of the room close to the door, and he would thus save us from intrusion, and be handy in case his services were required. He obeyed somewhat reluctantly, as he probably had expectations of gossip and probably an hour or two of gambling with the crew of the junk. The Chinese are inveterate gamblers, and my servant was not one of the exceptions that are said to prove a rule. Whether he was asleep before me or not, I cannot say, as he did not move a muscle after lying down, and his breath was as noiseless as that of a mouse. I called him once in the night for a glass of water. I'm not quite sure as to the exact nature of the liquid. And he was at my side in a moment to fill my order and glass. He soon lay down again as quietly as before, and I heard no more of him till daylight. He was the type of a good servant, with the ear of a fox, the eye of a hawk, and the foot of a cat. It was just fairly daybreak when I was awakened by a commotion on deck. There was a running to and fro, considerable shouting in the native lingo, which I couldn't understand, a pulling at the ropes and more than usual creaking of the rudder, as though the junk's course was being changed. For a few minutes I thought nothing of it, and then it occurred to me that after passing Breaker Point, we had almost a straight course for Hong Kong, and there was no occasion for deviation from it. The monsoon was a sure thing at this time of the year, and there was no likelihood that the wind had changed enough to require the junk to go about. I wondered what it meant, and as I did so I heard a slight rustling near the door. Looking around I perceived by the dim light which struggled through the mat curtain that John was on his knees, peering through a crack in the door casing, and apparently a good deal interested in what was going on outside. John, said I gently, but without eliciting a reply. I repeated the call in a louder voice. To my surprise, he gave a low hiss and motioned with his hand in my direction, without offering to move. I was on my feet in an instant, and as I rose, he again motioned me to silence. Convinced that something unusual was going on, and with a sense of impending danger, I obeyed the mandate and sat down on the edge of the chair. Perhaps five minutes passed in this way. It seemed a hundred times as long. When John left his place and came toward me. Masa no make bubbly, said he in a low whisper, which meant that I was to keep still. And I answered, can do. Then wishing to know what was the matter on deck, I asked, what for Mickey too much bobbly that side? John's answer, rendered from pidgin English to plain language, was to the effect that we were pursuing a junk with the evident intention of capturing her. 
he had caught enough of the conversation on deck to ascertain this for a fact and he said that the two taipans had been referring to my cabin and wondering if the fan kui foreign devil was asleep or not whether i turned pale or not at this information i never inquired there was very little light then and even if i did change color john was too well trained to mention the circumstance i certainly felt pale enough for a dozen ghosts and would have given all my prospects of advancement in the commercial world to be safe on shore the whole situation was plain for reasons best known to themselves the officers and crew of the junk had turned pirates and were in pursuit of a prize they had probably made up their minds to murder me as soon as i showed myself since my testimony against them would be decidedly inconvenient the only chance of my escape was that they would make an easy capture and plunder their prize without rousing me or my servant in such event they might possibly continue their voyage to hong kong and land me safely but it was by no means unlikely that they would put me out of the way on general principles john returned to his post of observation and auscultation and i sat still to wait the course of events hardly was he at the door when there was a slight noise outside and somebody spoke to him of course in chinese the voice was little more than a whisper john made no response the door of the room opened inward we had barred it securely or rather john had done so before retiring or at any rate secure enough to prevent ordinary intrusion but in case they wanted to open it a few blows with any of the heavy sticks about the deck would have finished the business for us in a very short time i crept to john's side and peered through the crevice two men approached with a piece of wood about the size of a handspike it was hardly large enough for a battering ram but it would answer why they should wish to break down the door without first trying to persuade us to open i could not understand i was not long in doubt as to their intentions instead of breaking down the door they barred it so it could not be opened a projecting cleat at the top held the fastening bar in place and the two men put it in this position so gently that they made no noise i was very thankful to the scoundrels for their forbearance and while i bore no ill will to the occupants of the strange junk i could not do otherwise than hope they would offer no resistance and allow themselves to be captured without making any fuss about it through my peephole the crevice i could see that we were gaining on her and if all went well for our junk the whole business might be over within an hour one man remained on watch at the door and john said he was instructed to report any noise inside our temporary prison he tried to look in through the crevice but in this we had the advantage as the flood of light outside prevented his discerning anything while we could easily see all that went on within range of our eyes we were now pretty sure of being undisturbed for at least half an hour and i determined to make as good use as possible of the time I had in my trunk a pair of revolvers and a box of cartridges, and my first thought was to get them out. Very quietly, so as not to be heard by the man on guard, John opened the trunk and brought out the weapons. The revolvers had not been charged for some time, and one of them was so rusty that I feared it might misfire in case of an attempt to use it removing the cylinder i lubricated it as well as i could with some salad oil and shook a few drops into the mechanism of the lock the same precaution was taken with its fellow and the copper cartridges were thrust into their places now my fine fellows i said to myself unless you have some new style of warfare i think some of you will lose the number of your mess before you throw me overboard I'm familiar with these things and can make them talk to some purpose. Next, we cleared the deck for action by stowing everything in the corners of the room, 
as there was not enough to make a good barricade with i peered cautiously under the edge of the matting at the window but dared not raise it for fear the sudden influx of light might be discovered by our guard and reveal the fact that we were awake there was nothing in sight not so much as a fishing boat and as far as we could make out ahead there was nothing visible save the junk we were pursuing we gained rapidly and though a steam chase is proverbially a long chase it was little over an hour from the time we were roused by the commotion that our junk lay alongside the victim ours was much the larger craft and far better handled and she carried more sail in proportion to her size the result was we came up to her side with more grace than you might expect from one of these clumsy vessels our men threw grappling hooks over the rail of their prize and her people had the good sense to make no opposition there was a short parley which was followed by the transfer of several boxes of sice silver and mexican dollars from her deck to ours altogether with half a dozen bales of silk and three or four chests of opium i felt relieved on finding that no one's throat had been cut not a shot was fired on either side but our fellows were quite ready for business as they had loaded their guns and stood with lighted matches ready to blaze away if necessary it began to look as though i would have no occasion for my revolvers and i expected every minute the men would come to unbar the door and restore things to their former condition the vessel separated and our junk resumed her course the stolen property was placed in the hold and everything appeared to be moving in the direction of peace when john startled me with the information that the rascals were discussing the propriety of murdering us Lalilung muchitoki one piece men del vosabi no can he remarked which is equivalent to the thieves are saying that a dead man doesn't know anything no one will dispute it and the phrase is not unknown to the languages of the western world it seemed that they had some doubt as to whether we had been playing possum during the little act of piracy on their part and it was urged that they could remove all question on that subject by throwing us overboard in favor of the later proposition was the value of the two boxes of silver and other portable property to which they would fall heirs if we were not present to claim it while discussing the question of what to do with us the worthy trio moved so far forward that they were out of earshot and we were obliged to conjecture the result for a time at least presently they came aft again and from the few words john could catch he referred that the decision was against us and we were to be disposed of the guard at the door was ordered to remove the bar as he obeyed the command i saw several knives flashing in the hands of the worst visaged vascals of the crew there could be no mistake as to their intentions and i determined to make the most of the situation i had already formed my plan which was to shoot the loda and his two fellow plotters and then use the rest of my cartridges on the crew if i could only take them unaware i thought i could finish the three head villains in about as many seconds and would be quite likely to create a panic among the crew if i succeeded but how to get at them in the right way if they would only fall into the air of letting us come out on deck before attacking us I would have the odds far less against me than while restricted to my cabin. The Loda said something in a low tone which John could not hear, and the men with their knives concealed behind them dispersed along the sides of the junk. Then the cook came to our door, and after pounding on it, asked John if he wanted my boiled rice with a fan quiz breakfast. John answered in the affirmative, but the fan qui was not yet up, and he would come for the rice as soon as it was wanted. Then the men put away their knives, and it was evident that they would do nothing until I appeared. Of course, there was no longer any occasion to be cautious about opening the window, and I told John to roll up the matting and open the lattice. I drew a good long breath, and as I did so, scanned the horizon. 
the air was just a little murky not exactly a haze but rather the suggestion of it in the horizon was not clearly defined though enough of it for all practical purposes as i looked astern i thought i saw a streak darker than the rest of the sky i looked again and was convinced then i called for my glass a powerful binocular which i brought from london and adjusted it on the streak that had caught my eye i uttered an exclamation of delight that jo caused john to turn and ask what ting massa makey look see my makey look see ping chuan gunboat i answered he makey come this side fati it is coming this way rapidly john ejaculated the equivalent for all right boldly opened the door and walked out to the deck but took the precaution to close the entrance immediately going leisurely forward he told the cook he would come for the rice in a little while and then returned with some hot water with which he was to perform the office of barber this imaginary service occupied nearly half an hour and then he went for the rice when he came back with it there was a commotion on deck as the approach of the steamer had been discovered and the loda was on the stem of the junk endeavoring to make her out i felt sure it was all right now or would be in a short time and i could turn the tables on the pirates they held a hurried conference and it needed no words to tell us they had agreed to let us alone till the steamer had passed and then it would be all up with us in order to gain time i told john to go back with the rice and say it was not properly cooked the Fanqui wanted it freshly boiled and would not get up till a new lot had been prepared. This gave me an excuse for keeping the door closed and for observing the approaching steamer. When I first saw her and replied to my servant that it was a gunboat, I could only guess as to its character, but I felt in my bones that it was one of those craft which the Chinese government had put in commission under foreign officers with native crews for the purpose of suppressing piracy as she came nearer i found that my guess was correct and she proved to be the boat whose duty it was to patrol the part of the coast from canton to amoy luckily she was coming directly on our course our rascal loda ordered everything to be made as innocent as possible in appearance the plundered junk was considerably off the course and there was little likelihood that she would make trouble the gunboat would soon pass us and then would come my turn to be dealt with during the civil war in america it was my fortune to serve on the staff of one of the prominent generals on the union side and while in that service i was detailed to signal duty i had become an expert in the work of signaling so much so that i was unwilling to admit i had any superiors in manipulating the flags though the system had not been adopted by the Chin chinese navy there were several officers on the gunboats who were familiar with it the captain of this very boat that was approaching us had served like myself in the american signal corps on the confederate side and i had recently made his acquaintance just a fortnight before that very morning i had stood on the shore at swateau and waved my handkerchief in a manner all mysterious to the wandering natives it said to the captain on the deck of a steamer come and lunch with me at noon an invitation which he promptly accepted when the gunboat was a mile away i stood in front of the window and with my handkerchief anchored shoe in pidgin english spelled out the words am in great peril don't reply i was fearful that if anything like the waving of a signal on the steamer was seen by the pirates they would suspect something and murder me before the gunboat could reach us again i spelled the words and added hoist flag at four i stood well inside the window so as not to be seen by the steersman or anyone else who might be on the platform above me and john kept watch at the door the whole crowd of rascals were too busy with watching the gunboat to give us any attention and i was half inclined to rush out and shoot down the head scoundrels before they could recover from their surprise 
I was beginning to fear that my signal had not been seen, when a ball went creeping up the foremast, and on reaching this truck it spread out onto a flag. I wanted to shout and turn a handspring or two, but prudence forbade. Then I told in a few words what had happened, and kept the handkerchief steadily in motion as long as it could be seen. On came the steamer, and ranged up within a hundred yards of the junk. And as she was fairly abreast of us, she slowed, and then backed her engines. Then she forged ahead, and by a few of those movements best known to steamship men, adapted her speed to that of the unwieldy craft from which she was not now fifty yards away. The Chinese Tyndall, or boatswain, of the gunboat hailed the Loda, and ordered him to drop his sails. He did not comply on the instant, but his movements were quickened by a cocked rifle bearing upon him. Then the whole crowd of pirates were ordered forward. A boat's crew, headed by the first officer of the gunboat, came on board, and not till then did I deem it safe to come out of my cabin. For never was a more astonished Chinaman than that Loda when, before I had spoken a word, they were told what they had been doing, how they had robbed the junk, and made preparations to kill me and my servant. Down to the moment when his head was removed from his shoulders at the execution ground in Canton, the week after his capture, the old rascal was puzzled to know how the captain of the gunboat found out the facts of the case. Whether he was since ascertained, I cannot say. John has told the story many times since that eventful day, and his explanation always is, Masa Mekitaki Hanker too. While the first officer was securing the pirates and becoming autocrat of the situation, my friend the captain stood on the bridge of the gunboat, and with his handkerchief spelled out, I shall expect you to dine with me. I was too excited to make any other reply than raise my hat, and nod in acceptance of the invitation. Until I stood on his deck and felt the grasp of his warm hand in mine, my heart was away up in my throat, and I couldn't say a word. And then, well, my heart came up a little further than before, and I fled to the cabin as fast as my feet would carry me. I didn't want the Chinese sailors to know what babies we foreigners are. The end of section one. Recorded by Michael Pluger, San Antonio, Texas. Section 2 of The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Pluger. San Antonio, Texas. The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories by Thomas Wallace Knox. Section 2. Frozen to an Ice Flow. In spite of its many perils and hardships, there is a fascination about Arctic exploration that causes nearly all who have engaged in it to wish to go again to the polar regions. Contrary to the general impression, the loss of life in Arctic exploration is not large. The hardships are very great, and the wonder is that so many who have sought the North Pole have ever returned to tell the story of their experiences. As you hear this story, ask anyone who may be near you what proportion of those engaged in Arctic exploration have perished within the polar circle. If a guess is hazarded, it will probably be anywhere from 20 to 50 percent and very few will place the figures lower than 10%. The fact is, the loss of life has been less than 2% of all who have ever gone in search of the Pole, or the Northwest Passage, or engaged in any other enterprises having for their object a better knowledge of the region of perpetual ice and snow. The first expeditions to the Arctic regions were made by John and Sebastian Cabot in 1497, and by Corte Real, Portuguese navigator in the year 1500, their object being to find a northwest passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Since their time, nearly 300 explanations of one kind and another have been sent out, 
some at the expense of governments and others at private cost. The Northwest Passage has been found to exist, but it is of no practical use. And as for the Pole, it has thus far defied all the attempts of man to reach it. Out of all the expeditions, large and small, only two have perished altogether. That of Sir Hugh Willoughby, which sailed in 1553, and that of Sir John Franklin, sailing in 1845. Willoughby's men starved to death within twenty miles of a Lapland village, where there were thousands of reindeer. I have not the space for even a limited history of Arctic exploration, but will come at once to the incident indicated by the title, Frozen to an Ice Flow. Years ago, in northeastern Siberia, I made the acquaintance of a Russian who had been a member of an expedition sent out by a commercial company to collect the tusks of mammoths from the Lykov Islands in the Arctic Ocean. The Lykov Islands lie off the north coast of Siberia, and are so far in the Arctic regions that they are destitute of vegetation, with the exception of a few lichens and mosses. In ages gone by they must have been much warmer than at present, as they were covered with forests in which the mammoth roamed at will. He was in such numbers that the recollection of his tusks has been a profitable industry for a long time past. The tusks are found embedded in the frozen earth, or are cast up from the depths of the ocean by the waves during severe storms in summer. We reached the islands without much difficulty, said my Russian friend, and gathered a good stock of ivory that had been cast up by the sea. In a cliff of frozen earth that had broken off since the previous season, I found a tusk solidly embedded, and it took me two or three hours to chop it free. There was great satisfaction in discovering it, not only because it was a valuable find from a commercial point of view, but because I was bringing to light something that had been concealed for a period variously estimated from 10,000 to 21,000 years. The ivory is not as good as that from Africa, where it is taken from the elephant killed on the spot. It is whiter and more brittle from its long exposure to frost, but is a very good article for many purposes. When we were ready to go back again to the mainland, we found that a storm had broken up the ice for a considerable part of the way where we had found a firm road only a little while before. There were many lanes of open water where we would need boats to ferry us over, if no other means of transit could be found. The sea was full of great hummocks and flows. In fact, there was a great deal of ice to a small quantity of water as one looked at it from the shore. As the passage under such circumstances would be very dangerous for our dog sledges, we decided to wait until the frost had closed the lanes of water and restored the route to a passable condition. So we returned to the work of hunting for ivory and found three or four tusks. As we already had as much as we could undertake to carry with safely, we concealed our latest finds where we thought they would be safe until the following year. The islands are visited very rarely and there was little likelihood that our ivory would be disturbed. The weather grew much colder in a few days, and the frost closed the open water as we had hoped and expected. One of our men went out several miles on the ice, and, as his report was favorable, we started on a return to the coast. We could not travel fast, except on the young ice, as the old ice was very rough and much of the way we were obliged to chop down the hummocks and otherwise smooth the way for the dogs and sledges. A mile an hour was a good average for us as long as we were in the hummocky ice. When we found young ice, recently frozen, we went along at the best speed of the dogs, as they seemed to enjoy getting over the road rapidly whenever they could do so. The days were long and the night short. In fact, there was very little night and had it been earlier in the season, we should have found the daylight continuous. We halted occasionally to rest ourselves and the dogs, and of course we halted during the nights, or from ten o'clock until two, when the sun arose. Unfortunately for us, on the second day the wind rose with the sun, and very soon it blew a gale. 
the effect of the wind upon the ice was alarming we were tossed almost as though we had been in boats on the water and the cracking and crashing of the ice was deafening great fissures opened in all directions and we found ourselves on a cake perhaps a quarter of a mile long by one half that width as long as the cake held together we were in no immediate danger but if the wind continued it was very likely that our refuge would be destroyed far as we could see was a mass of mingled ice and water tossing and heaving with the effect of the high wind while we were considering what we should do there was a crash almost at our feet and the ice floe on which we stood was broken into a dozen cakes we had three dog teams and a driver to each team and when the crash came two of the teams were on one cake of ice while the third was upon another the drivers were tungusian natives and had passed their whole lives in the arctic circle and all had previously made the trip to the lykoff islands though they had passed through many adventures and perils they had never been in a place of such great danger as they now found themselves you may think they deserted their teams and tried to find safety for themselves they did nothing of the kind but stuck manfully to the animals though it is possible they did so through a belief that the dogs would be a help rather than an incumbent in bringing them to a place of safety there were three of us russians and each of us accompanied one of the dog teams and directed its movements though the control of the dogs was left to the drivers when the ice floe broke up i found myself alone with my team and its driver and the cake on which my friends were was drifting rapidly away from us through the influence of the wind and the currents that prevail in all parts of the arctic ocean to the south of us was some ice that seemed to be quite firm and of considerable extent and i shouted to my friends to try to reach it we decided that the only way to do so was to swim the dogs through the water first throwing away all the ivory which we could not hope to save the sledge relieved of the weight of the ivory would easily float and we could cling to it and thus have something to support us we threw off the ivory from the sledges and just as we were getting ready to take to the water i observed that the course of our flows had changed and they were drifting the way we wanted to go the wind had chopped around to the north and was acting in our favor and what was also noticeable it was less violent than before though considerably colder while i was shouting to my friends and telling them what to do the ice gave way beneath me and i was thrown into the water a fragment was broken away from my flow in some way that i could not understand and it was on this fragment that i was standing at the time with the help of my driver i clambered out but had much difficulty in doing so as the ice at the edge of the flow was very slippery and both the driver and myself were encumbered with the thick clothing that is necessary in those high latitudes quite exhausted with my exertions i sat down to rest with my back against a small hummock as one stops by the wayside and leans against a milestone or a friendly wall i was chilled almost to freezing the north wind was very cold and i knew that i must remain only a moment for i was lest the lower temperature should render me insensible meantime the water was draining from my clothing and i was getting breath after my severe exertion the edge of the flow struck against the larger body of solid ice the dogs seemed to realize the necessity of taking advantage of the situation as they darted at full speed from the smaller flow to the firm ice with the first word of their driver i had often admired their intelligence they would cross thin ice at a full gallop not giving a time to yield beneath them where a smaller rate of speed would have certainly caused them to break through and i had seen them jump over fissures two or three feet in width and drag the sledge after them as though dogs and sledge were but one in the present instance they made a single bound in clearing the space that separated them from the firm ice and when they reached the place of safety they stopped as though at the word of command i sat leaning against the hummock watching the dogs and drivers at their work while my team was getting to the firm ice my friends were following its example their ice flow having taken the same course 
as my own. When all were over, they shouted for me to join them, and I tried to rise. I made the effort and found that I could not move, but for the moment was not aware of the cause. Again my friends called to me and added the alarming information that the flow had been caught by an undercurrent and was drifting away from the firm ice. Run for your life, said one of the party. The flow was drifting away. Again I tried to rise, but could not. My strength had fairly returned, and I knew it was not weakness that held me back. Another effort, and I realized my situation. I was frozen fast to the flow. I tried to shout the cause of my remaining where I was, but the words stuck in my throat. I could hear the voices of my companions growing more and more faint in the distance as I drifted away. Suddenly it was dark, and then I remembered nothing more save an effort to undo the clothing that held me fast. But it was impossible to turn or move so as to secure my release. My hands lay at my side as my limbs were held fast in the icy bonds. It was impossible even to make a signal. A statue could not have been more immovable than I was, nor less capable of making known its conditions. The darkness that came over me was the darkness of a swoon from which I did not wake for hours. Two of our faithful Tungusians came to my relief, ferrying themselves across the open water upon a cake of ice. They cut me loose from the ice that held me, and then, as no time was to be lost, they ferried my insensible body over with them to where my anxious friends were standing. They stripped me and rubbed my body with spirits and oil which we always carry on the sledges for just such emergencies. For an hour and more I gave little signs of life, but finally I was able to speak, and some of the spirit was poured down my throat. This helped to revive me, and in a few hours I was all right again, though terribly stiff and sore from my immersion in the water. They wanted to place me on one of the sledges, but I insisted upon walking, as I knew the exertion would prevent the return of a chill. In a few hours we reached the shore, and fell in with a band of wandering Tungusians, who supplied me with dry clothing and plenty of food. We told them about our adventure, and where we had left the ivory. Several of them started to find it, and by great good luck they secured two of the tusks, and brought them away. End of section 2. Recorded by Michael Pluger. San Antonio, Texas. Section 3 of The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Pluger, San Antonio, Texas. The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories by Thomas Wallace Knox. Section 3. Captured by Cannibals. In many ways the world is rapidly becoming prosaic. The age of chivalry has gone long ago, if we may believe a celebrated writer. Stream has destroyed the romance of the sea, the mystery of the unexplored regions of Africa exists no longer. The maelstrom is a myth. The sources of the Nile have been visited and described. And even the sea serpent has fallen before the searching gaze of star-eyed science. The car of Juggernaut, which once crushed hundreds of victims in its annual processions, now remains harmless in its temple. The cremation of living widows at the sides of their dead husbands is rigidly prohibited through the length and breadth of India. And the kings of Uganda can today receive a distinguished visitor without slaughtering a dozen courtiers in his honor. The horrible fascination that clings to the cannibal in the story of his performances is greatly circumscribed, as the labors of missionaries and the spread of commerce have demonstrated that man can be put to better uses than to be served up for provisions. But the cannibal still lingers in some parts of the world, though he is only to be found by those who seek him with great diligence. 
within the memory of those of us who have not yet passed beyond middle life the inhabitants of the fiji islands were noted for their habit of devouring bodies of their enemies and also under certain circumstances those of their friends since missionaries and merchants were established there and the island became subject to great britain the british prejudices have prevailed and the practice is not confined to a few benighted tribes of the interior when the missionaries began their teachings the natives gave ready approval to the scriptural injunction love your neighbors but they were disappointed to learn that it had no reference to the love of a gourmet for a canvas back duck to noah the old ruler of the fijis and father of the late king tang kam bao had a palate so delicate that he could distinguish between the english sailor or the french one when served at the table and he could even name the people of the different islands of the fijian group when a slice of each was placed before him an acquaintance of mine claims to have had a narrow escape from being the piece de resistance at one of tanoa's banquets and of being taken to and into the royal bosom he told me the story one day when we were sailing over the pacific and wondering if the good old times of the cannibals would ever come again i was on a whale ship said he that was cruising in the south pacific and had put into the fijis for water the ship was old and leaky the captain was a tyrant and his first mate a brute and every sailor on the ship was ready to desert at the first opportunity we had a chance to go into one of the groups where there were no cannibals but the captain knew that if he did there wouldn't be a man of us left his only hope of holding on to a crew was by having them choose between the ship and the natives who would eat them up the most frightful stories were told about the practices of the people and not one of us would venture a yard from the beach where we landed to get water we kept the natives at a distance and made them understand that while we would leave plenty of trinkets and old hoops on the shore to pay for the water we wouldn't go near the little creek on the beach unless they stayed a good way off from it they had no canoes there and so they didn't bother us by trying to get on board one afternoon a party of us had gone ashore to fill the last of the casks the mate was with us and it was one of his ugliest days for he kicked us about as though we had no more feeling than the boat or the ground we stood on because i didn't please him about something he struck me with an oar and then i struck back with my fist and downed him the rest of the men pulled me off but they didn't pull very hard as they were all right glad to see the fellow pounded at last when they got us apart i saw what i had done and knew the mate would have his revenge on me as soon as we got to sea again i thought it all over in a second and in my frenzy concluded i might as well be eaten by the savages as beaten to death by the mate and thrown over for the sharks before we made another port i turned and went straight for the bushes where i knew the natives were watching us i just said good-bye to my shipmates and nothing more they yelled for me to come back but i didn't turn nor stop the mate started after me but he thought better of it and wheeled around before going twenty yards in five or ten minutes i was in the middle of a group of natives who were armed with spears and clubs and had their bodies streaked and painted in a hideous way they wore no clothing except a strip around the waist and more than half of them could not boast as much as that they tore off my clothes and then examined my limbs exactly as a butcher examines an ox to ascertain his condition one old fellow who seemed to have some sort of authority over the rest pinched my arm till i almost screamed with pain the fact that i didn't scream seemed to impress him favorably and at word from him i was less rudely treated after that i wasn't a particularly good prize as the hard fare on the ship had made me pretty thin and my ribs fairly stuck out so you might count them i saw they disapproved of me but probably they reasoned that half a loaf was better than no bread and so they took me along three of the natives escorted me through the tropical forest while the rest remained 
probably with a view to making more captures if opportunity offered, or to gather up whatever the ship's crew should leave behind in payment for the privilege of taking water. We did not stop till we had gone a couple of miles back from the shore and ascended a hill. Through a rift in the trees, I saw the boat return to the ship with the water casks, and in a little while the anchor was raised and the old craft sailed out of the bay and stood away to sea. I was alone with the cannibals. We waited for the men who had stayed behind, and as soon as they joined us, the march was resumed. A little before sunset, we came to a village of thatched huts, perhaps twenty or thirty in all, in a sort of irregular circle surrounding an open space. In the center of the space was a raised platform, over which was a thatch roof elevated on posts about ten feet high. This was the council hall, where all public business was transacted. It served as a lounging place by day, and also as a hotel where strangers could be lodged at night. The sides of the structure were entirely open when we arrived, but in less than a quarter of an hour the building was completely enclosed by strips of wide matting stretched between the posts. I was made to understand that I must remain in, and to make sure that I did not run away, two of the natives were constantly at my side, or rather, one was constantly at each side of me. They brought me some roasted breadfruit and raw coconuts, gave me a mat to lie on and another for covering, and while never relaxing their vigilance toward me, they treated me with kindness and respect. I didn't sleep well, you may be sure, and what sleep I had was disturbed by unpleasant dreams which seemed to foreshadow my fate. But when waking I consoled myself with the reflection that I should have been no better off had I stayed on the whale ship and been subject to the mate's cruelties. In the morning they fed me again with bread, fruit, and coconut, to which was added a fish which had been roasted over the coals and was really very good. The whole population, men, women, and children, came to look at me, and after a good deal of jabbering of which I could not understand a word, but which evidently referred to me, two of the men started through the forest in a direction opposite to the one whence we came. Then the conference broke up, but for the rest of the day I was an object of curiosity. For three days I was kept a close prisoner, and the morning of the fourth was taken through the woods by a winding path, perhaps twenty miles to a large village, where hundreds of natives were assembled as if for a grand festival. The village surrounded an open space of at least an acre in extent. At one end of this space was a mound or platform, perhaps eight feet high, and in front of the platform was a stone that looked like a large gatepost. Old Tanoa and his principal officers were sitting on the mound just behind the stone. The natives, armed with their clubs and spears, were scattered over the level ground and waiting for the terrible ceremonies to begin. I was led to the foot of the mound, where half a dozen other prisoners, their hands and feet securely tied with cords, were lying on the ground, and at a word from the king I was similarly bound and placed by their side. The crowd opened so as to make a lane from the stone to the end of the plaza, and then began the terrible ceremonies which preceded the cannibal feast. Fires were burning at the rear of the mound, and I could see the smoke rising in feathery curls from at least a dozen places. Tanoas waved his hand as a signal that all was ready, and immediately several athletic fellows stepped from the crowd. Two of them seized each prisoner, and carried him about fifty yards away from the front of the mound, and then placed him on the ground again. All my fellow victims were natives, and as I learned afterward, were captured in a foray upon a neighboring island. It was the custom among the Fijians in cannibal days to devour their prisoners of war and those killed in battle. Tribes often went on the warpath solely for the purpose of obtaining victims to be served up as food, very much as in other land expeditions are organized for hunting deer or other wild animals whose flesh is edible. The crews of wrecked ships or boats were often killed and eaten. 
They were regarded as the gifts of providence, and the people often besought their gods to send them a wreck that they might be provided with food. This superstition regarding those who were unfortunate enough to be cast on the shores was more firmly fixed in the mind of the cannibals than any other, and they clung to it after relinquishing their claim to make war in order to eat those whom they captured. A conch shell was blown as a signal for beginning the slaughter. One of the prisoners was seized by his two custodians, who each grasped an arm and a leg, and then ran rapidly along the lane till they dashed their victim's head against the great stone I have described. Then another and another was disposed of in the same way, and carried off to the rear of the mound, and my turn had arrived. Horrible as this mode of death, it was, after all, a merciful one, as it was unaccompanied by torture. A single blow against the stone, and all was over. I had been lying on my back, and my head turned to one side during the dispatching of my companions in captivity, and, with my experience as a sailor, had managed to work loose the knots that bound my hands, but I did not move the cord. My executioner seized me, in the customary manner, and started on their deadly mission. As they did so, they doubled my legs under me, so that the knot around my ankles touched my hands. Instantly I unfastened the cord, but still held hands and feet as closely together as though the lashings were secure. And now for the grand stroke, which should save me. Suddenly I gave a violent spring with hands and feet that threw my bearers to the ground, as they were totally unprepared for anything of the kind. I went to the ground with them, but was up in an instant. We were not six feet away from the foot of the execution stone, and the head of one of my late bearers touched it. With the agility of a cat, for I was a great deal younger then than now, I sprang to the top of the mound and right in front of old Tanoa. I flung my arms wildly about, and then dropped on the ground at his feet. I afterward learned that he thought I was invoking the vengeance of heaven upon him for the great peril I had passed through, and my prostration was to indicate that he was the greatest of terrestrial sovereigns. I really had no thought further than to ask that he would spare my life, though I had counted on the dramatic effect of my having released myself from my bonds and stood before him. A wild shout went up from the crowd, and the king sat as though he had never been more surprised in his life. If I had been down by the stone, I should have been finished off in a minute, but at the feet of the king I was safe until he ordered otherwise, as it would be highly improper for the warriors to mount the platform while his majesty was there. The seconds seemed like hours, while I waited for the king's decision, which he finally gave. The dead are dead and shall be eaten. The white man shall live. The bodies of those who had been killed were cooked and devoured. I was allowed to go about wherever I pleased, but was always accompanied by two warriors. They offered to show me the ovens, but I had no liking for the horrible sight and indicated my desire to get as far from it as I could. Besides my ineffable disgust, I was fearful that the king might change his mind, or that some of his subjects would take upon themselves the attack of executioner, and dispatch me without the royal leave. But I must do them the justice to say that from that time on they never manifested the least desire to harm me. I was sent back to the village, where I was first taken after my capture, and became the slave of the chief, but my slavery was of the lightest sort. I was treated more like a companion than a servant, possibly for the reason that as the Vigians can practically live without work, there was very little work to do. I learned a good deal of their language, went with them in the forest and in pursuit of fish, and loitered around the council hall when there was nothing else to do. I lived there nearly a year, and if I could have been assured that there was no danger of being slaughtered and eaten, I should have been perfectly willing to stay among those people the rest of my life. They were unwilling to have me leave them, 
and twice when ships came in for water they hurried me away from the coast to make sure that I did not escape. Whether they desired my society or were actuated by the fear that I should tell about their customs, I never knew, but certainly they tried by every means in their power to prevent my leaving them. In the course of time they grew less watchful, and I occasionally went off by myself for a few hours without exciting suspicion. I always went toward the coast, but invariably took a circuitous route. When sight of the sea, I scanned it carefully for a sail, and if none was in sight, immediately retraced my steps to the village. Toward the end of the year, I did this every day or two, or as often as I thought it safe. I generally returned with a bunch of bananas or a cluster of breadfruit, so that my absence was ostensibly in search of food. One day my heart came into my mouth. As I looked through a rift in the trees, a ship was standing into the little bay, where our old whaler had anchored at the time I had my fight with the mate and threw myself into the arms of the cannibals. Away I went down the path, as fast as I could run. Luckily I didn't meet anyone, and went at such a pace that no pursuer could have overtaken me. Out I came on the beach, just as the anchor went down to the sandy bottom. I looked back and thought some of the village people were coming. I didn't wait to make sure of it, but plunged in and swam off to the ship. It was a long swim, and I was near drowning, but I got there all right, and was hauled on board. The captain heard my story, then ordered me to be dressed and set to work, and I went to work with a will. He was rough, blunt, good-hearted man from New Bedford. His mate was pretty severe with the men, but a vast improvement on my old one. All's well that ends well, and I had nothing particularly in regret in that eventful residence in Fiji. I afterward learned that my former ship went down with all on board a few weeks after I deserted her, and so my escape to the man-eaters was my salvation. End of section 3. Recording by Michael Pluger, San Antonio, Texas. Section 4 of The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danny Hogger, www.dannyhogger.com. The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories by Thomas Wallace Knox. In a Shark's Mouth. The shark has a wide range all over the globe, principally in the tropics, where he reaches his greatest size. His family has a goodly number of members. The greatest is known as the Basking Shark, and he attains a length of 40 feet and upward but is not by any means the most ferocious of the family. The next to him in size, and by far the most dangerous, is the white shark, which is found in all tropics all around the world, but most numerously in the West Indies, on the coast of Africa, and in the Malay archipelago. A great many stories have been told about the white shark, or man-eater, as he is often called, and he may be set down as one of the creatures most dreaded and hated by those who go down to the sea in ships. Sailors are the sworn enemies of the man-eating shark, and never fail to kill him whenever they have the opportunity. He follows ships for the sake of what is thrown overboard. The sailors have a superstitious idea that when he does so, his presence foretells a death on board, and therefore they get rid of him as soon as possible. As he is voracious, he is caught with a hook with comparative ease, and if the line is sufficiently strong, he can be hoisted on board as soon as hooked. More commonly, a rope is secured around his body for hoisting purposes, and as he comes up to the vessel's side, his tail is severed with an axe to prevent his doing damage with it. Then he is swung in on the deck and killed, or, if the sailors are in a sportive mood, they free him again and enjoy his contortions in the water in his attempts to swim without a tail. The shark is pitiless toward them when they are within his reach, and they reciprocate by showing no pity or mercy. 
before the shark. The rider was once on board a ship that was becalmed at sea and surrounded by a dozen or more sharks. One was caught and killed in the manner just described. A second was allowed to go after his tail had been severed, and a third was marked for a still more painful fate. A large brick was heated to a red heat in the galley fire, and then a piece of asbestos packing was wrapped around it as quickly as possible. The brick with its covering was encased in a piece of pork that was tossed overboard, along with several other morsels which the sharks were ready to devour, and it had no sooner touched the water than it was swallowed. It took a few minutes for the heat to come through its covering of asbestos and pork, and during these few minutes the shark swam along his companions and attracted no special attention. But very soon his movement showed the pain he was feeling. He darted violently about, sprang out of the water, dove, rose again, and was evidently suffering intensely. This continued for perhaps half an hour and ended with the creature turning on his back and dying in the most horrible contortions. The other sharks showed their tender feelings by attacking him before he was fairly dead. They had no compunctions about eating him, or at any rate, they displayed none, for he was devoured before our eyes to the great delight of the sailors. The mouth of the shark is situated on the lower side of his head, in such a position that it is necessary for him to whirl over on his back to seize anything. This necessity of turning over is taken advantage of by pearl divers and others who have occasion to go into the water where sharks abound, and it gives a skillful swimmer a chance to get out of his way while he is performing his somersault. Pearl divers in the waters of Ceylon and the Persian Gulf often kill the shark by means of the large knife which they always carry to aid them in detaching the pearl oysters from the bottom. They dive beneath him and plunge the knife into his body, and whenever he turns to seize the dart to one side and make ready for another blow. Of course, this can only be done by an expert swimmer who is not encumbered with clothing of any sort. These divers work without any garments, and, as they are accustomed to the water from their infancy, they are almost as quick as fish in their movements. One of their methods of fighting the shark is to take a stout stick, about two feet long. Knife and stick are in a belt around the man's waist, and thus equipped, he swims confidently toward his adversary. The shark turns on his back to seize the tempting prey. Quick as a flash, the man places the stick upright between the jaws of the monster, and as the ends are pointed, they pierce both the upper and lower jaw when the shark attempts to close upon the obstacle. He cannot get rid of the encumbrance, and he is powerless to bite. The diver may attack and kill him as leisurely as he likes, for with his mouth thus fixed in an open position, the creature cannot even make his escape by swimming away, for the simple reason that he cannot swim. A man must be very skillful in the water to be able to kill a shark after this method, as it requires the most perfect self-possession to put the stick in its proper position and at the right moment. On a steamer which I was once a passenger, there was a man who had lost his right foot and went around with a pair of crutches. He was a Frenchman who had gone to the East Indies in his younger days and was said to be a wealthy merchant in one of the principal ports of Asia. Naturally, the other passengers were curious to know how he had lost his foot, and their curiosity was all the greater when, in answer to a question on the subject, he briefly said, it was bitten off. He showed no intention of gratifying their desire to learn more on the subject until one afternoon, when the conversation had become interesting, through the narration of adventures of travel and hunting in various parts of the world, something was said about sharks, and it led to several stories, some of which were certainly a good deal exaggerated. They seemed to rouse the Frenchman, and when the last narrator had paused, our friend of the crutches and a single foot said, I'll tell you a story about a shark I had a fight with, and he's the one that bit off my foot. Of course, we were all silent at once, as everybody wanted to know how he had suffered his mutilation. He allowed us to remain so for a minute or two, and then he began. About ten years ago, I went up to the Persian Gulf, on a pearl speculation, along with a countryman from Bombay. We had a schooner loaded with an assorted cargo of the kind of goods suited to the trade, and, as we were considerably in advance of the other spectators, we did a good business as long as it lasted. The divers bring up the oysters that contain the pearls, and then heap them on the shore to rot. 
and such a stench as these rotting oysters make it would not be easy to match in other part of the world. When the oysters are turned into a decaying, or rather a decayed mass, they are dumped into a trough and washed through men's fingers, and great care must be taken to save all the small pearls. But that hasn't anything to do with the scoundrel that bit off my foot. The sharks hung about the oyster beds, and hardly a day passed without one being seen, and sometimes every diver that went down reported one or more. Several of the man-eaters were killed, and we began to think the beds were free from them, as none had been reported for two or three days. Our schooner was anchored a mile or more from shore, as the water where we were was very shallow, and, besides, we were more convenient to the fishermen than if we had been nearer to the land. We went back and forth in a native boat as we found it much cheaper to hire one of these crafts than to keep a part of a crew waiting to row us about. It was not always easy to find a boat when we wanted it, but on the whole we got along very well. One afternoon, my partner and I were coming ashore, and I had got about midway from the schooner to the land, when one of the boatmen suddenly called out that an enormous shark was right ahead of us. He pointed in the creature's direction, and my eyes followed the motion of his finger. The shark evidently saw the boat and concluded that he would get beneath it, on the chance that something edible might be dropped overboard. My curiosity got the better of my caution. I was so anxious to see the great monster that I forgot that the boat was very cranky, and the least motion from one side to the other made an upset quite possible. I lost my balance in leaning over the side, and almost before I was aware of it was in the water and right below me was that enormous shark. My head was covered with a sola tope, or sun hat, one of those pith and cloth contrivances worn by nearly every European in Asia, and by no means unknown in other parts of the world. It came off my head as I touched the water, or possibly fell off just before I tumbled. Anyway, it must have caught the shark's eye before anything else, as he went for it without a moment's hesitation. He whirled on his back and crunched the innocent hat between the great jaws as you have seen a dog crunch a chicken bone. He was not long in discovering what a poor article of food it was as he quickly turned his attention from the hat to its owner. I thought my last moment had come. I was not an expert swimmer and besides was encumbered by my garments. Though the latter really made no difference to a man who could not move more quickly than I in the water. I made only one or two strokes with my hands before the shark seized me by the foot and dragged me beneath the surface. A hundred pounds to the man who saves him, my partner shouted to the boatman in their own language in which he was proficient. A hundred pounds to one of those boatmen would be like 10,000 to anybody in England or America. It was enough to take great risks to get it. Amodau, the chief of the boatmen, was a skillful pearl fisher and boasted that he had killed many a shark while pursuing his occupation. The offer of a hundred pounds was a stimulus that set him in motion instantly, and hardly were the words out of my partner's mouth before the honest Amadou was over the side of the boat with his knife gripped between his teeth. In the clear water of the gulf he could see a long distance, and a dozen vigorous strokes brought him to the side of the shark that was dragging me away. They not only brought him at the side of, but under the shark, and the next instant the knife was plunged to the hilt in the creature's vitals, making him release his hold on my foot. Two or three times, and very quickly too, the knife was plunged, and then Amadou turned his attention to me. I was more dead than alive, and when he brought me to the surface I fainted, so that he was obliged to support all of my weight. Had another shark happened along at that moment, one of us would certainly have become his prey. I was lifted into the boat. The water I had taken into my lungs was expelled by the customary expedients used upon persons in a drowning condition, and after a while I recovered. My foot was crushed into a shapeless mass and could not be saved. It was amputated by a young doctor on board an English ship, then in the gulf, and in course of time I was restored, as you now see me. How long were you under water? One of the listeners asked. I don't think it was over two minutes, was the reply. From the time the shark pulled me down until Amadou had me at the surface, the whole thing was done so quickly that it would have seemed very much like a dream had it not been for the terrible reality of the loss of my foot and the sensation of being in the grasp of a shark. 
that is something nobody could ever forget. Certainly I can never forget it if I live to be a hundred years old. Then the Frenchman excused himself and hobbled away to his room. Another of the party told how he had seen a shark blown up with gunpowder, very much in the same way that his fellow was killed with red-hot brick. A small can of powder with a lighted slow match attached to it was embedded in a piece of pork and thrown over a ship, which was followed by a large shark. He swallowed the pork with its explosive cargo, and the rest of the story tells itself. End of section four. Recorded by Danny Hogger, www.dannyhogger.com. Section 5 of The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories. Now, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories by Thomas Wallace Knox. Beset by Chinese Pirates. In the harbor of Hong Kong, the attention of a stranger is arrested by the number of Chinese junks, armed with cannon and otherwise presenting a warlike appearance. On inquiring their character, he is told that they are peaceful traders, and their armaments are intended for defense against the pirates that infest the waters of the Flowery Kingdom. The cannon are clumsy affairs and seem to have been made hundreds of years ago. The carriages are as clumsy as the guns they support, and the crew of the junk do not suggest anything of the man-of-war style when one contemplates them with an eye toward naval operations. The junk is a tub whose best sailing cannot exceed four or five miles an hour, and it is very evident that a modern gunboat from an Occidental Navy yard could destroy a whole fleet of these unwieldy craft inside of an hour or two. But the junks and their means of defense are exactly like the junks and the offensive weapons of the pirates, and so the honors are easy. It is whispered about Hong Kong, and in no low tones, that these apparently peaceful traders do a little piracy on their own account. Let an armed trader meet a defenseless or weaker one where no spectators are about. It is quite possible that the enterprising captain of the stouter vessel will be unable to resist temptation. Perhaps he will be satisfied with plundering the craft without harming anybody, merely threatening to show no mercy next time, in case his victim should mention the present occurrence to the authorities, if he is of adamantine heart. He will not be content with such mild measures. He slaughters the crew and burns the unfortunate junk after removing everything of value, and then continues peacefully on his voyage. His crew is bribed to silence with a portion of the stolen property, and also through the dread of losing their heads in case of discovery. The victim of the exploit forms an addition to the missing list, and nobody troubles himself about the matter except the few persons directly interested and they of course can learn nothing and the affair is soon buried in oblivion another form of piracy in chinese waters is conducted from the shore and not from sailing crafts at sea the pirates have places of rendezvous along the coast whence they come out with swift boats propelled by a large number of rowers and pounce upon any sailing vessel that may be becalmed or drifting with light winds within their reach. Once in possession, they kill without mercy every human being they can find. Dead men tell no tales is the motto of the Chinese pirates, as it used to be of the corsairs of the West Indies and the Spanish main. If the ship is European, she is invariably burned after the removal of her cargo or its most valuable portions if she is native she generally meets the same fate but sometimes the captured junks are taken to the piratical rendezvous where they are refitted and changed so that their mothers wouldn't know them and afterwards taken to hong kong or to one of the chinese ports and sold 
of late years piracy in chinese waters has been greatly reduced by means of the fleet of steam gunboats built in chinese navy yards or bought abroad they are swift and of light draught generally commanded by europeans and manned by chinese carry a few small but very efficient guns have well drilled crews and altogether can knock to pieces in a few minutes any pirate craft that comes within their range these gunboats cruise along the shore visit all the bays where pirates are suspected of having their rendezvous and occasionally come upon the rascals in the midst of their work but you cannot change the ways of a people all at once and even with its fleet of gunboats its constant service the chinese government is still annoyed by the pirates and will doubtless be further annoyed by them for years to come latterly the pirates have been much more chary of attacking foreign ships than they were thirty or forty years ago partly on account of the stubborn resistance that is generally made and partly because they know they are liable to be followed up by foreign warships as soon as their misdeeds are known in attacking a foreign ship a favorite weapon of the pirates is the stink pot more elegantly known as the asphyxiating vase it is an earthen pot or vase filled with a most villainous and evil smelling compound the vase breaks when it is thrown on the deck of a ship and the stuff scatters about and puts in its fine work immediately the european nose cannot endure it but the chinese nose is not specially disturbed europeans are driven from the neighborhood of this odor-laden shell and thus the pirates obtain the opportunity of mounting to the deck two or three years ago an english steamer lying peacefully at anchor in a bay in the lin chow peninsula was captured in this way the pirates came alongside unsuspected a few of them mounted to the deck and threw a stink-pot where it would do the most good and then the rest followed and the steamer was captured without the shedding of a single drop of blood the fact was the steamer was on a smuggling expedition and in a place where she had no legitimate business as the crew had made no resistance the pirate captain was kindly disposed and permitted them to retain their heads he gave them a small junk in exchange for the steamer and started them on their way to hong kong the steamer was plundered but not burned notice was sent to the chinese authorities at canton and a gunboat went down and took final possession there was no attempt to pursue the pirates as their offence was greatly mitigated by the illegal business of the steamer probably the chinese government would be willing to condone all similar piracies and thus break up the operations of the foreign contrabandists hong kong is a nest of english and other smugglers and the british authorities at that point throw all possible protection around those who violate the revenue laws of china in the eyes of the officials of hong kong there are no revenue laws worthy of respect other than those of the united kingdom a friend of the writer had a narrow escape from death at the hands of chinese pirates like the crew of the steamer mentioned above he was engaged in smuggling at the time of his adventure and was therefore not in a position to invoke the full protection of the authorities the ship to which he was attached was anchored off the coast not far from macao and under the shelter of the sun chow islands in the daytime operations were suspended and nearly everybody slept but at night there was activity from one end of the ship to the other and many chests of opium were transported to the shore the officials in the neighborhood had been properly bribed and everything went along smoothly my friend was second mate of the ship and accompanied half the boatloads to the point where the opium was delivered to the comprador of the chinese house to which it was consigned while the first mate attended to the other half the captain third mate and supercargo looked after matters on shipboard during the absence of the first and second officers the rest of the incident is best told in his own words it was about five miles from the ship said he 
to a place where we landed the opium and turned it over to the comprador each of the boats had a chinese crew of rowers under charge of a malay tindal or boatswain and the only white man of the party was the mate in charge between sunset and sunrise each boat made two round trips and for the first two nights there was no trouble of any kind on the third night each of us had made one trip the first mate's boat went ahead of mine and it was our rule to get one party clear off from the ship before beginning to load up for the other you see we were liable to a visit any time from some of the customs officials who hadn't been squared or more especially from the foreign employees of the government who were on the lookout for a capture out of which they could bag a good reward only one chest of opium was brought on deck at a time and not until it was safe in the boat was another one hoisted up in case of a sudden visit the boat had orders to pull off at once into the darkness and at the same time the hatch would be closed and everything made ship shape by the time the officers could get on the deck there wouldn't be a chance for suspicion that we were doing anything else than lying at anchor of course it would require lying of another sort to convince them that our presence there was entirely innocent but we were ready with an abundance of that kind of the article just as the first mate was ready to pull off on his second trip for that night one of our sharp-eared fellows detected the sound of oars in the water everybody was ordered to keep still and listen and sure enough we could distinctly hear the splash that indicated the movement of a boat it was a slow and cautious sound and indicated very plainly that the men who were making it wanted to get as near as possible before they were discovered there was no time to unload the opium from the mate's boat he dropped astern with the slight current that was running and was soon out of sight the tackle was passed down to my boat and in half a minute we had her swinging by the davits where she belonged and everybody out of her the chinamen were ordered below and as they went down the hatch one of them said to me waving his hand in the direction of the approaching boat plenty piecey lolly long belonging this side good many thieves around here i caught his suggestion on the instant and immediately told the captain what the man had said the captain was at first inclined to laugh at the idea as no pirates had been heard of there for a long time but a moment after said it was just as well to be on the watch for mischief to confirm the suggestion that there might be something wrong the approaching boat stopped rowing which it would not have been likely to do if its mission was an honest one everything was still on the ship and we had hoisted in the boat so quietly that the little noise we made was drowned to their ears by the sound of their own rowing the half dozen european sailors of our crew were on deck with us the captain sent two of them below with me to bring up some rifles which were kept ready in the cabin and also a box of hand grenades that were intended for the kind of fighting which might be going on in the next quarter of an hour i carried a revolver at my waist and so did the captain i buckled on an extra one and brought up another for the captain and in less than three minutes from the time i went below i was on deck again and everybody was armed and at his post of course you understand that the chinese part of the crew is of no use chinamen make good soldiers when properly drilled and disciplined but in their civilian condition they cannot be relied upon the best thing to do with them is to keep them below where they had been sent after resting a few minutes and hearing no sound from the ship the rowers bent to their work again and very soon the boat was at our side it was a long and low craft of the kind called a snake boat partly from its shape and partly because of its superior speed we hailed her and the only reply we received was flynn friend a moment later a stink pot was flung upon the deck the missile was well aimed in one respect but badly in another instead of striking the deck and breaking to pieces as was intended it fell into a tub of boiled rice which the cook had set out for the breakfast of our chinese boatman the soft rice received it tenderly 
and the odiferous weapon was harmlessly embedded where it could do no great injury to those for whom it was intended the pirates endeavored to follow their opening shot and take advantage of the confusion it might have created they sprang at the sides of the ship under her forechains we saw what they were up to and as fast as a head showed above the rail in the dim light it received a bullet from rifle or revolver at very close quarters while several grenades were flung at the boat two of the sailors dropped their rifles and armed themselves with handspikes one of them said afterward that he could shoot much faster with a handspike than with a gun as he lost no time in stopping to reload two of the scoundrels got over the rail one of them had me by the throat when a sailor laid him out with a blow across the back and finished the job by flinging the man overboard he struck just in time as the man was unusually powerful and had me pinned in such a way that i could not use my revolver in five minutes the fight was over the pirates as many as were left of them paddled off as fast as their snake boat could carry them and in a direction opposite to that whence they came hardly were they gone before the mate came rowing through the darkness he had found it no easy matter to get his crew to return to the ship as they knew very well that we had been attacked by pirates and they had no liking for the company of those fellows all of the mate's threats to shoot them unless they bent to the oars were of no avail they would not pull a stroke until they heard our shout of victory and the sound of the oars as our assailants pulled away we hadn't a man hurt although we had a very narrow escape from capture and consequent death and the unhappiest man of all our party was the first mate because he didn't have a hand in the fight End of section 5